Good evening. I'm Susanne Ebbinghaus. I'm the Curator of Ancient Art and also um, the Head of the Division of Asian and Mediterranean Art. And I would like to welcome you to tonight's lecture on behalf of our director, Martha Tedeschi, who very much regrets that she is sick and cannot be here. The lecture by Dr. Parodi celebrates the opening of the exhibition, A New Light on Bernard Berenson, Persian Paintings from Villa Itati, that is on view in our university teaching gallery on the third floor. Bernhard Berenson, a graduate of Harvard College, class of 1887, established himself in Florence as a world-renowned connoisseur of Italian Renaissance painting. He maintained close ties with his alma mater, ultimately bequeathing to Harvard his Italian residence, Villa Itati, along with his art collection and a large library. Villa Itati today serves as the Harvard University Center for Italian Renaissance Studies, but Berenson's interests in collecting were not confined to Renaissance art, and the exhibition highlights his collection of Persian paintings and manuscripts, which are on view on this side of the Atlantic for the first time. We are very grateful to Villa Itati and the present director, Professor Alina Payne, for collaborating with us on this project, which also involves the conservation, the study, and the publication of Berenson's Persian manuscripts and miniatures. The project was launched by Professor Lino Pertile, the seventh director of Itati, and by the previous director of the Harvard Art Museums, Tom Lenz. Professors Payne and Pertile cannot be here, but we are very happy to have in our midst um, another previous director of Villa Itati, um, Professor Joseph Connors. Here at the Harvard Art Museums, Aishin Yolta, assistant curator for Islamic and later Indian art, has spearheaded all aspects of this project. She conceived the exhibition and assembled a strong team of scholars to study Berenson's um, Persian collection for a volume that will be published by Villa Itati. As the exhibition shows, she has um, revealed a fascinating web of connections between Berenson and a small circle of other American collectors of Persian art. Penley Nipe and Catherine Ehrman from the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Study led the conservation and scientific analysis of the objects. Catherine Beatty of the Weizmann Preservation Center worked on the unbinding of one of the manuscripts to improve its condition and to ensure its safe handling and display. A big thank you to the many staff members at the museums who worked with Aishin to create this beautiful exhibition. We would also like to thank the other lenders to the exhibition, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and the Pierpont Morgan Library and Museum. Support for tonight's lecture is provided by the M. Victor Leventritt Fund, which was established through the generosity of the wife, children, and friends of the late M. Victor Leventritt, Harvard class of 1935. The purpose of the fund is to present outstanding scholars of the history and theory of art to Harvard and the greater Boston communities. Tonight's speaker, Laura Parodi, fulfills this role on many grounds. Aishin Yolta will now introduce Dr. Parodi. Thank you, Susanna, and thanks for uh, coming to uh, the lecture. And also, I invite everybody to go upstairs after the lecture to view the exhibition. Um, today's speaker, Laura Prodi, as uh, Susanna mentioned, uh, is one of the 14, 14 authors who are contributing to the book. And each of them is writing on a different aspect uh, of Berenson's Persian manuscripts and miniatures. I would like to thank all 14 of them here, um, but especially those who could, if only a few of them unfortunately could make it tonight, but um, uh, Dr. Eleanor Sims, Professor Priscilla Suchek, and the museum's paper conservator, Penley Knight. Um, all authors shared their studies with me, even when they were not finalized, and uh, the labels in the exhibition uh, very much reflect their new research. The exhibition upstairs, which I hope you had or will have a chance to see after the lecture, reflect Bernard Berenson's taste and eye when knowledge on Persian paintings was meager. It was mostly a visual appreciation of a different aesthetic by dealers and collectors. The fact that these paintings illustrated texts to be read was mostly irrelevant. 
In fact, many were removed from the manuscripts or albums and sold as single pages. Sometimes paintings were cut out from their surrounding texts. Over a hundred years have passed since Berenson collect, uh, uh, collected his Persian paintings. Our study for this project now includes specialists in art history, literature, conservation, even statistics, just to be able to expand our knowledge of these works of art. Our speaker tonight will give an in-depth analysis of one object in Berenson's collection. I'm afraid you have to wait for the book to read the rest. Laura Parodi uh, is an independent scholar based in Genoa, Italy. Uh, she has taught courses and seminars at the University of Oxford, University College Dublin, and MIT here in Cambridge, and two Italian universities. She is the author of numerous essays on Mughal art and architecture. Her interests range from manuscript studies with a focus on albums to architecture, more specifically gardens. In 2010, she was a fellow in the Aga Khan program here at Harvard. Between 2013 and 2015, she directed one of the teams in a project supported by the European Science Foundation and produced a pioneering handbook of comparative oriental manuscript studies published in Hamburg in 2015. Among her recent publications targeted at a wider audience is an article titled The Taj Mahal and the Garden Tradition of the Mughals published in the current issue of Orientations. It is my pleasure now to invite Dr. Parodi to give her lecture, Cracking the Code, Glimpses into the Making of a Mughal Album Folio from the Itati Collection. Please welcome. So first of all, I would like to thank Aishin Yolta Yildirim for inviting me here and for organizing such a beautiful show and for keeping all the threads together for uh, the book that's forthcoming and that I'm really looking forward to. I would also like to thank the colleagues in the conservation department here at the Harvard Art Museums, um, Catherine Ehrimin and Penley Knipe for the work they've been doing on the object I'm, doing, I'm going to talk about. And last but not least, the uh, friends who've been um, helping me locate and or translate some of the more elusive verses, including in this album folio, uh, Sunil Sharma and Willer Thaxton. And of course, the Leventritt Fund for making this possible. Now, Bernard Berenson acquired this album folio in 1911 from an arts dealer in Paris. Berenson's interest was sparked by a Persian painting believed to be by Bezard, an artist who had hailed from what is now Afghanistan and lived between the late 15th and the early 16th centuries. So roughly a contemporary of the Italian Renaissance artist that Berenson was working on. More than a century has passed since Berenson acquired this folio. And at the time, he was probably not even aware that he had laid his hands on an album folio from Mughal, India. For him, this was probably just a Persian painting framed uh, by an ornamented margin. And that is how you're going to see it um, in the exhibition, um, in a frame hanging from a wall with a typical Western emphasis on the figural image. There's nothing wrong with that especially in the context of an exhibition on Berenson's collection. But album folios were not experienced in this way originally. And so tonight, I would like to try and take you on a journey to explore facets of this album folio that you would not otherwise be able to see, including, for example, its recto or calligraphy side, which is not on display, it's hidden from view. So first of all, for the non-specialists, I'd like to just briefly introduce the album. What is an album? It's essentially a collection of materials of varied provenance, typically uh, calligraphy specimens and or uh, paintings, and sometimes artworks from other cultures outside the Persian-speaking world, uh, for example, European engravings, as in this specimen, which is also from an Imperial Mughal album, although a different one. 
With very few exceptions, the materials collected in albums are in a paper medium. This means they are thin, fragile, relatively small, and easily damaged if handled repeatedly. So um, in the 15th century, this kind of material begins to be assembled in albums. And the individual pieces are set into somewhat thicker paper frames, uh, forming folios similar to pages in a book, which were then stitched together to resemble a book, something you could easily leaf through. This would both preserve the materials and arrange them according to a certain logic. Now, obviously, kings and princes did not fashion the albums themselves, they employed artists, and the artists laid out the concept of the album as well as the actual albums for them. The parents and folio was part of an album produced at the Mughal court in India in the first half of the 17th century. Now, how do we know? We know because it, resemble, it bears a close resemblance to other album folios that are now dispersed uh, across different collections. For example, this folio here on the left is now in Dublin. It's quite similar. And also, this, these folios here are now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. This dispersal is typical of Mughal albums produced before the 19th century. It means that no collection is whole and the original arrangement is lost. So um, why is this the case? Well, firstly, because albums are heirlooms, so they were passed down several generations and a new owner might typically discard something and add something else. But albums were also looted uh, when enemies raided a palace. And sometimes also leaves were sneaked out of imperial libraries and sold. And finally, of course, the art dealers of the 19th and 20th centuries um, often took the albums apart to sell the folios separately, separately um, in order to maximize their profits. And so one or more of these circumstances may apply to a particular album, including the album we're currently looking at. So scholars strive to reconstruct the original sequences in which folios appeared in specific albums or to establish connections between the folios. Why is this relevant? Because beautiful as individual folios might be, albums followed a certain logic, as mentioned. And even though albums were not books, their logic was somewhat comparable to that of books. Um, a dispersed album page out of context tells a limited story, but a dispersed album page in context contains layer upon layer of stories waiting to be unraveled. And the first layer, of course, is in the painting itself. And I propose to look at its surface first, and then somewhat deeper, and finally around it. As mentioned, Berenson thought this was a work by the um, Persian, in, in the Persian style, um, painted by the late 15th and early 16th century master Bezat, who lived in Herat, in what is now Afghanistan. And um, indeed, among the objects scattered on the floor of the terrace depicted here is a portfolio with an inscription that says, the work of Bezat. Another inscription was added uh, on the margin after the painting was framed for inclusion in the Mughal album. It reads, and specialists will forgive me if I just give a loose translation that's more accessible to the general public. It reads, portrait of the venerable Jami, work of the master Bezad. It is, in fact, very similar to um, an inscription found on another Mughal album folio, which is now in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, and the words work of the master are almost identical um, in both folios. In the New York folio, they were attributed to Jahangir, the fourth Mughal emperor who reigned in the early, six, in the early 17th century from 1605 to 1627. 
other aspects of the Barrington folio connected with the New York folio um, and other related folios, as we shall see. But before that, as mentioned, I would like to take a closer look at the painting itself. So, like Berenson, Jahangir was uh, regarded himself as a connoisseur of painting. And like Berenson, Jahangir was interested in collecting works by Bizard, not only because of the master's high repute, but Bizard had been working in Central Asia for the ancestors of the Mughals. The Mughals were descended from Timur, uh, known in the West as Tamerlane the Great, and even though they founded a new empire in India in the early 16th century, they remained very proud of a Central Asian ancestry. And so the painting would have meant a lot to Jahangir. It would have, meant, it would have been seen as a kind of dynastic heirloom. But we know today that this assembly of sages um, was not painted by Bezad, but by a close follower who was active a few decades later, around the middle of the 16th century. Um, for comparison, the, I've, I've uh, chosen to show a relatively similar composition that dates from Bezad's time. It is from a manuscript that was produced in Bezad's milieu, whether it's by Bezad or by someone else in the same atelier, um, I leave that to the specialists, but just to give you a sense of the kind of style and environment that the um, Bukharan artist was, trying, was harking back to uh, about half a century later in the 1540s in, or 1550s in Bukhara, in present-day Uzbekistan. So ironically, this, the artist that painted Berenson's page and Jahangir's um, beloved painting worked for the Shaibanids, who were the arch enemies of the Mughals, uh, because they had displaced their ancestors from Central Asia. But the Shaibanids, a uh, Mongol dynasty, were equally eager to emphasize their connection with the past splendors of Tamerlan's dynasty. And if their Mughals, uh, the Mughals were their blood descendants, the Shaibanids had inherited their territory. And this explains why the painting harks back to a somewhat archaic style a few decades before. You can see the figures are somewhat lost in, in, in the environment surrounding them. Um, the space itself is probably as relevant as the figures. And you can also see a combination of earthen hues and touches of brighter color. Um, the Berenson painting may in fact be the work of an artist who produced illustrations for a, another manuscript from Bukhara that is dated and, and currently in Geneva. Some of the figures are virtually identical. In all likelihood, um, the painting now included in the Berenson folio was indeed produced to illustrate a manuscript originally. And I'm showing you similarities between the figures in the two um, works. So it was most likely produced to illustrate a manuscript originally, but decades later at the Mughal court, it was extracted from the manuscript and inserted in an album. At that point, we should bear in mind, whatever it might have depicted originally was probably forgotten, because what mattered was its new role in the album. And this is what we are concerned with, this second phase, this second life of the painting, which is only one in a series of actually lives, as is quite typical of Mughal album pages. So, what we, see, so we need to figure out what this painting meant in its new context, because we have no information on that, except in the painting itself. And what we see is a group of men with attendants or disciples seated on a terrace behind which is a garden. From the clothes and turbans, the men seem to be mystics of, or men of learning, certainly not kings or warriors. The gold sky, however, is a sign that we are probably looking not at the depiction of an actual event, but at an imaginary scene um, with symbolic overtones. 
And the empty canopy that you see here is possibly there to suggest that the master of the house, perhaps the ruler himself, was symbolically present at this gathering, even though he was physically absent. Now, these were things that were in the intention of the original painter, of course, the original artist. But then we'll come to the way these features were adapted and in order to um, convey a specific meaning within the album. But a first lesson uh, that we may learn from this folio is that when you look at this kind of work, you should not take um, paintings literally, because more often than not, there will be some metaphorical, allegorical, or symbolic overtones. So here, the gold sky, the empty canopy, they're telling us that there's something beyond the figures, something beyond what we see on the surface. Let's now look a little bit deeper into the painting. Um, the uh, colleagues in the conservation department have done really a good job here, um, revealing aspects of this work that would not have been detected otherwise. For example, today, the terrace offers a poor contrast to the sky. And the mat or rug that some of the men are seated on is barely visible and barely told apart from the terrace. But infrared light here on the left reveals that originally the color of the terrace was light blue. This is commonly seen in paintings from Bukhara. Both the terrace and the mat, however, received a wash of Indian yellow, an organic pigment that is easily detected in infrared light. You can see these bright luminescent areas um, in, in the picture on the left. So there's a second lesson that we can learn from this folio. Do not believe everything you see, because more often than not, paintings included in albums were modified at a later stage, and they're more like palimpsests. And there's more. If you look at the painting carefully, even with the naked eye, you will see that it was extended to the right. Now, elongated pictures were popular in Bukhara, but not in Mughal India, so the picture was extended, maybe to make it more standard within the context of the album. The colors were imitated closely, but the pigments used were not the same, so they deteriorated differently or reflect differently in infrared light. So, particularly this figure here, you can see is something, and you can see a kind of crease here that separates the two um, sections. Um, and perhaps the most important finding um, uh, with infrared and, and ultraviolet is that, did I say infrared? It's an ultraviolet picture, of course. Sorry, it's an ultraviolet picture. <laughs> um, Perhaps the most important finding concerns the flowery plants. If you look at some of the original plants shown here, you will see that the leaves are a sort of brownish yellow. And this color is often found in Persian and Central Asian manuscripts of the 16th century. Um, and there are examples even in the um, exhibition downstairs. Look at these cypresses. Um, it makes no sense to have brown or yellow cypresses because they are evergreens. So for a few years now, I've, I've been suspecting that something was going on, that this must have resulted from deterioration of probably an organic pigment. And now fortunately in this folio, we probably found the answer because the Indian artist who painted the extension, and this is a close up of the extension, uh, in the Berenson folio, copied the original plants as closely as possible, but he used a different mixture. And his plants preserved the original details, allowing us to imagine what the original plants must have looked like. And as you can see, there are details such as veins added in blue, and the blue is indigo. At this stage, it was not possible to determine what caused the indigo to fade in the original painting, possibly some binding agent, and you can make out some of the faded veins perhaps here, but the overall impression is just yellow. So thanks to the Mughal extension, we've learned something that teaches us um, and, or guides us in the interpretation of, of 
a much broader range of, of Persian paintings. And a third lesson to be learned here is that more often than not, the paintings collected in albums are palimpsests with layers and sometimes entire sections that are later additions. Let's now move from the painting itself to the area around it. And let's try and imagine the team that was in charge of compiling the album. They probably discussed some guidelines with their patron before the project started, and then regularly submitted their work to him for approval. Um, images were framed, as you can see, in ornamented margins. And this one is slightly faded. It was probably a darker hue of, of pink originally, so that the gold ornamentation would have stood out. Um, but images were also very often associated with poetry. And the verses in this case were selected on the basis of, well, in, typically, were associated, selected on the basis of some association with the image. It could be a pun, a kind of commentary, um, and work in this uh, respect is only just beginning. We're just beginning to explore these connections. Um, the more intricate the interplay between the text and the image, probably the better in the eyes of the patrons. Um, an important factor to consider is that these verses were literary quotes, so they often bore no connection with the image originally. There must have been someone in the team of compilers who was well versed in poetry and who was in charge of fishing out appropriate verses to go with different images. Now in this case, the verses are extracted from two different sources. The text above and below um, the image is a fragment from a poem in the Masnavi verse written by Alishir Navoi who was a leading intellectual, a patron of the arts, and a politician in the time of Bezat. The verses are in Chagatai Turkish, uh, the ancestral language of the Mughals. They are poorly preserved, and they have not been identified so far. But these other verses, which run all around the image, and below the frame, um, are from a poem by Jami, the same Mullah Jami that Emperor Jahangir's inscription identifies as the subject of the painting. Jami was also a contemporary of Bezad. He was a mystic, an intellectual, and a poet in the circle of Navoi. So the verses are in Persian, and they are from a Ghazal, which may be compared to the English sonnet. And this is the translation. Jami being a mystic, we should understand these verses perhaps metaphorically rather than literally. In any case, the garden is there. Um, the garden setting is there, and not only that, but the name of the poet is explicitly mentioned. At on, on the right side of the frame. Um, interestingly, although the verses by Navoi has, have not been identified or translated, um, his name also appears at top left. So probably the compilers of the album wanted to suggest that Xiaomi and Navoi were the two main figures in this uh, assembly of sages. And they're clearly engaged in some kind of conversation. And the conversation is possibly what we see in the verses. So we only have part of it for the moment. But the subject of this conversation was probably connected with the overall theme of the original Imperial album. And so another lesson to be learned here is that the image needs to be examined together with the texts that are associated with it bearing in mind that the connection between them was created by the compilers of the album. It does not coincide with the intention of the original artist. Let's now broaden our perspective and explore the folio in connection with the album. I previously suggested a connection with a folio in New York, um, a folio with a hornbill. 
And in fact, the Berenson folio is compatible in size, style, and ornamentation with the whole corpus of album folios that are now dispersed across various collections. They are known by different names today, and for the specialists, these are the Minto, Montage, and Kevorkian albums divided between the Victorian Albert Museum in London, the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and the Freer Gallery of Art in Washington, DC. And a few folios are scattered in private collections as well. And to the best of my knowledge, this folio has never been connected with the corpus before. So it's the first time, to the best of my knowledge, that we're attempting to explore this connection. So these um, different, um, these, these, these fol uh, album folios that are now scattered across different connections, uh, collections uh, are thought to originate in just one imperial album project, although the album itself probably consisted um, of more than one volume. The album was produced for the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, whom we've already met and established a connection with, and for his son and successor, Shah Jahan, who reigned from 1628 to 1658. It's one of just few albums produced for the imperial Mughal court, and none of them survives intact. This particular album probably remained in the imperial Mughal library until quite late. At some point in the early to mid 19th century, the album, um, one or more of its volumes were torn apart, and some of the folios were duplicated, copies were made. And then the original folios and the copies were mixed and matched and fashioned into new albums that made their way to Britain, where they began to surface towards the end of the 19th century. And that's when they were acquired by uh, major museums um, in the early 20th century uh, from, from private collectors. And the Berenson folio, even though it was purchased in Paris, also came from Britain originally. We know this from Aishin Yolter's research. So materials from this imperial album comprise scientific studies of animals, Jahangir was very fond of these. This is, after all, the 17th century, so there's a scientific interest, an interest in the exploration of nature. It's the early modern era. Um, I find the word medieval associated with Muslim patrons just too often. The Mughals are part of the early modern era. They are modern in so many respects. So scientific studies of animals, you've already seen three of them, and you're going to see a couple more. Portraits of the emperors and their officers, so this is Jahangir himself. Allegorical figures, such as this mystic saint whom Jahangir could never have met, and yet both are depicted here, and a number of calligraphy specimens. Now, interestingly, the vast majority of the calligraphy, of the calligraphy specimens in this album is arranged diagonally, and we'll see that this is a significant feature. Now, the rect of the Berenson folio, which you won't be able to see in the exhibition, but I'm showing it here on the right, so I suggest you take a good look, also features calligraphy. But it is one of just very few folios in which the calligraphy is arranged not diagonally, but along horizontal and vertical lines. It is also one of the few folios that deviate from the predominantly floral ornamentation that is found in most margins from this album. And actually, the pattern on, on this margin is, is unique in the whole corpus. 30 years ago, in this book, an attempt was made to reconstruct, at least conjecturally, the original sequence of folios in the original imperial album that these folios come from. The authors of this book based their reconstruction on two criteria. One is the alternate use of calligraphy and painting, which seems to be consistent in this particular album. So one opening with calligraphy, you must imagine opening the album and leafing through it from right to left, the direction in which the Persian is, is, is written. So one opening with calligraphy, 
then followed by one with paintings, another opening with calligraphy, another one with paintings, and so forth. This seems to be, based on what we've got, the logic of this album. And in fact, the, Itati, the Berenson page also has a painting on one side and calligraphy on the other. So the, this is, was, was the first criterion. The second uh, guideline that was used in this reconstruction, attempted 30 years ago, was the presence of tiny numbers written in gold in Persian numerals um, just on one side of the paintings from this album. So as mentioned, this is probably the first time when this folio is considered um, because the authors of this book did not consider the Berenson folio. They did not include it in their analysis. And interestingly, when we bring it into the picture, we come to rather different conclusions from those proposed 30 years ago. Now, the authors made a note of all the numbers and of the various subjects illustrated. And they found three sequences. Two of them have odd numbers on the verso and even numbers on the recto. For example, in this case, we have a study of two vulture species associated with the number 39, and a study of a dipper in three different attitudes associated with the number 40, and the number is somewhere here. Um, there is a second sequence that duplicates the same number, so there are doubles sometimes. Some of these numbers appear twice. Um, but there is also a third sequence in which the numbers are reversed. So you have the um, even numbers on the verso and odd numbers on the recto. So the reconstruction proposed nearly 30 years ago identified three incomplete sequences which may correspond to three volumes. The Berenson folio contains the number 15. It's, you can actually see it here, although you can't read it. It's here near the painting. Um, following the logic, the same logic, we should expect it to have faced a painting associated with the number 16. And there are two such uh, folios. One depicts a sheep. It's in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin. Um, but this is a more likely match for another folio in which a zebra appears. The zebra, like the Berenson folio, is associated with the number 15. The other painting associated with the number 16 is a work by a female artist, Nini, after a European engraving by the Wierix brothers depicting the martyrdom of Saint Cecilia. And certainly, these may have some points have been combined together, as is testified by the number. So at some point, probably these two folios faced each other. Uh, remember the Berenson folio? Um, is missing part of the lower margin, so the proportions are not um, accurate. But the calligraphy on the recto of the Berenson folio, the side that no one has ever really looked at, has a different story to tell. And it's one that challenges this entire reconstruction based on numbers. Whereas Berenson and ourselves, as Westerners, may be more inclined, or as art historians, may be more inclined to give priority to the figural images, it is practically certain that the patrons of albums valued the calligraphy more. The specimens were carefully selected, valued for their textual content, as well as the authorship of the calligraphy. There were, they were works by famous artists, no less than the paintings, and probably more than the paintings in their own time. The Berenson folio, pictured here, features a portion extracted again from a ghazal, a sonnet. But this time, it's by the famous poet Hafez, one of the greatest poets, uh, the greatest Persian poets of all times. It is a famous poem. Um, and then verses from a 15th century poet, um, Shahi of Sabzavar, are inserted vertically in separate frames. These have also been identified and translated, but for our purposes tonight, we're going to focus on the verses by Hafez exclusively. And this is a translation, and the section in green is the portion found in the Berenson folio. There's also a verse in brackets, but I'm going to 
explain that in, in a moment. Two other folios from our imperial album, now dispersed, closely resemble the Berenson folio. One is in the Metropolitan of Ar uh, Museum of Art in New York, and surprise, surprise, it includes the beginning of the same poem, alongside more verses by Shahi. Another folio is in Dublin, and it includes um, the end of the same poem. Um, minus one verse, probably for reasons of symmetry, so that there was an equal number of verses on each folio. So in other words, we have two and a half verses in New York, two and a half more in the Berenson folio, then possibly a gap, which we may assume corresponds to a missing folio, and finally, the last verses minus one. The Dublin folio also includes a signature which attributes the calligraphy uh, to Mir Ali of Herat in present-day Afghanistan, who was, you may have guessed, a contemporary of Bethat. So I'm not sure whether the attribution is reliable or spurious because the paper looks different and some of the letters are traced differently. Of course, I'm not a calligraphy expert, but that's my impression. But that is not our main concern now. The real question is, so the poem begins, continues, then a gap, and then it ends here. And the real question is, if we follow the logic based on numbers, the four folios, which contain two halves of the same poem, each opening would contain half of it, would end up at different locations, or even in different volumes, because the dump numbers don't match. And this makes no sense at all. Because Jahangir, who was so fond of Hafez that he opened his collection of poems uh, at random to seek omens for the day, would want to read the poem in a continuous manner. Although he certainly knew it, very probably knew it by heart. So we need to revise the sequences proposed almost 30 years ago, I think, which must reflect a later rearrangement and we need to suggest a different sequence. And we could begin from our folios with a sequence that might provisionally look like this. The Dipper, which we previously saw, is painted on, on the rector side of the New York folio where the Ghazal begins, where the sonnet begins. So it may have faced the vultures. There's no reason for the moment to discount this association. They look fine together. And then turning the page, we'd find the first half of the poem by Hafez. Then the assembly of sages, a missing folio, missing picture. And then the second half of the poem. And finally, a portrait of Jahangir himself, which may have faced this picture of a saint offering him the keys to the world. The name Jahangir means world Caesar, and several portraits and allegorical pictures um, painted during his reign reflect this connection. And don't be deceived by the physiognomic accuracy of these portraits, because this is an allegory replete with literary references, and it's been studied before. So these two images have long we thought to belong together, but because the numbers didn't match, it was thought they had been divided in the album. And now the, the issue is completely reopened. We, we should start anew, or at least that's what I propose to do. So coming to a close. So this is a, an additional lesson to be learned from the Berenson folio, that we should probably look more closely at the texts, both those, I would argue, in the calligraphy panels and those inscribed inside and around the pictures. Um, this would really help um, to reconstruct the original album sequences and to begin to understand the logic of the albums more. <laughs>
I'm probably saying something obvious, but we've, it's something we've only begun to realize over the past two or three decades, really, through the work of, of, of several colleagues. Um, but this could be expanded into a more ambitious project, perhaps. That's my hope, at least. Um, the connection between Hafiz, Jami, and the portrait of Jahangir in this case may not be readily apparent to us today, but on the basis of the emperor's mystical inclination, which are well known, we may see this text perhaps as a kind of admonishment, emphasizing the need to shun the material world and pursue higher aims, and all of this as a prelude to the depiction of Jahangir's investiture, as it were, at the hands of a saint. And this is material for another talk, of course, or for an entirely new project. But I hope that this brief introduction to Imperial Mughal albums through a kind of keyhole provided by a single folio, gave you a sense of the beauty and complexity of Mughal albums and the challenges we face as art historians, because even a single folio um, emerges as a collective work of art with numerous contributors, so many layers, so many patrons, because as we have seen, there is more than one face and probably more than two and a rich history to tell. And the final lesson, perhaps, is the most obvious, is that when we look at visual artifacts, we should always be willing to expand the gaze beyond the surface of things. Thank you. Go behind you. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture. Um, uh, Laura decided to take uh, the questions herself, so uh, we're uh, um, taking the microphone around, so if you have questions, just please. Oh, so boring that it doesn't deserve. No, I don't believe that. I might have been boring, but the page isn't. The folio isn't. Could you expand on the relation of gardens in the manuscripts and gardens in, say, uh, the Mughal court? Okay, this is something I actually work on. Um, let's go back to, yes, here. Um, there, is, there are elements that refer to actual gardens. For example, typically there was a terrace at one end which would open up onto the landscape. So uh, you should imagine, we've been used to, um, from scholarship from 80 years back, we've been used to thinking of, of Islamic gardens as something enclosed um, and completely locked out of their environment. But in fact, gardens in the fertile land that Afghanistan was, that present day Afghanistan was in those times, because Herat was really one of the bread baskets of Asia. Um, gardens in that environment were full of water, full of vegetation, full of uh, trees that produced edible fruit and very open to the outside. So they were built on terraces. They were making quite spectacular use of water with large pools and channels that cascaded and tumbled down. And what we see here in Bukhara, well, it's a slightly drier environment, but that was the the model they aspired to. What we see here is a terrace that is very likely at one end of the garden, so with another kind of landscape, agricultural landscape, in the background. But ideally, these people would have been facing um, a slope and looking out to, onto the landscape around them. So it was a sort of privileged viewpoint. I don't know if I answered your question, but on the other hand, it's a very idealized landscape that we see here, beginning from the gold sky. It's clearly not a reflection of reality, or it is, but only to a certain extent. For sure, people in those times used to gather in gardens. And there were these private parties. At the court, there might be wine passed around, and in this case, maybe these were religious people, not so much wine passed around, but certainly poetry recited at these gatherings. So 
a literary circle is another way of calling this assembly of sages, perhaps. Thank you for your uh, excellent talk. I wanted to ask about the phenomenon you point out where a single poem is continued um, despite kind of being interrupted by openings of, um, of painted images. And I wondered if, uh, first, have you seen other instances in the Minto, Wantage, et cetera, in, in uh, folios from this album that also have um, a poem continued over several folios? And, and, and also, does this lead you to think about the way that someone would have perused an album a little bit differently, that instead of kind of pausing at an opening and then moving to the next, that in fact their attention is kind of being th um, um, extended um, to connect and, and tie folios together, even if they're interrupted by a pictorial opening? So I don't have a definitive answer to this because I've been checking all of the published and unpublished um, folios or folio sides because a calligraphy is not published in its, in its entirety. But there's a lot of material. And I only realized that the, that the verses didn't make sense in different volumes relatively recently. What I do see is that this stands out as probably the original nucleus of the album because the decoration of the margins is very uh, archaic. It doesn't have these flowery plants. There, there are some studies by Sue Strong on, on the way this reflects textiles or the ornamentation and architecture. Um, and it may be, we're not sure, but it, because of this pervasive nostalgia of Herat that you see in the calligraphy, in the poem, in the painting, and then boom, Jahangir as a highlight after, if this sequence is correct at all. But I, I really don't think that it makes any sense to split this poem, you know. Um, it could be the incipit of the album, that setting the tone as it were, in Jahangir's time. Um, so, no, I haven't found other texts that, that run like this, but simply because I haven't had the time to check the materials yet, since I realized that this made sense. And also, the verses by Shahi are also given in the same sequence in um, a late 15th manuscript that I consulted it may be a coincidence, of course, divans were, you know. Uh, but, but it seems like these folios were really crafted in just one go and, and, and perhaps meant to belong together. It's just a suggestion that I'm making. It's uh, for, for all of us to just find other examples. So that's why, that's why I was suggesting it would deserve a bigger project because there's quite a lot of material and it takes people who are experienced in literature I mean, if, even if I read the verses, I, I won't necessarily be able to. I mean, this was Hafez. It's so so, so easy. I mean, we, we, we can all access Hafez. But in, in other instances, we need someone who knows where the excerpts are from. Um, but I think, yes, probably one of the, it's one of the possibilities in an album that, you know, there's a connection between materials at various points. I mean, David Roxborough suggests that with some of the visual materials in some of the Persian albums that he examined, that one was supposed to leave back and forth. Um, so yes, there probably were connections um, that leapt uh, from. And, and I think there's a connection with the painting as well. Because this is Mirali, and maybe the text makes sense together, maybe. <laughs> or it isn't Mirali, but Jahangir thought it was, or his artist wanted him to think that it was. <laughs> I'm not sure quite how to formulate the question, but where you talk about the gold sky and the space beneath the canopy as being empty as suggesting uh, something beyond, um, and then in the poem, well, the, the, there's this, this whole theme of uh, um, the beloved and the rose and the, the relationship between the rose and the thorn and the, the sorrow that that can um, evoke. Um, 
I'm wondering, this, I mean, this perhaps goes beyond these works that you're talking about to a, a larger question, but um, you can choose in your response to go to the larger context or, or these. How much is this beloved a metaphor, a, a mystical metaphor? You know, we, we read of this in other works as well. And how much is it um, an actual beloved? I mean, and then when you select the two main characters as being two men, would the beloved ever be considered as a woman? of whom they would be in, con uh, in conversation about. Now, the reason I think this is more of a metaphor is simply because it's Jami, who was a mystic. And his relationship to Alisher Navoi was that of a sort of, it was a circle of intellectuals. Uh, in other instances, of course, in Persian painting, it's in Persian poetry, it is a more literal love relationship. Uh, man-to-man -man relationship, of course, but here, and because of the context that it's taken from, Jahangir was a lot more interested in the mystical side, and so were the artists in Bukhara when they illustrated Jami. I mean, he really is an, an epitome of, of, of mystical poetry. Is, is there a, uh, are there variations in the, in the original of how the word beloved would be uh, written and expressed depending on its literal or less literal meaning? I'm, I'm not an expert. We have some experts here, I think, but I don't know if they want to address the issue. <coughs> hmm? I'm certainly not equipped to say how the word beloved changes or is used or uh, I don't know, I'm sorry. We may pursue the conversation later. This is much more pedestrian, but could you tell us something about the seal in the upper right corner of this page? Oh, yes. That's something I deliberately left out. Um, so that's a seal that provides the name and title of, of Jahangir and the names and titles of his ancestors all the way up to Timur. And it's a 1612 seal, but it is out of context because it is stamped, this same seal impression is found on all of the Wantage album materials, including the 19th century folios. So what probably happened is that they were, the, the dealer in, in either in India, that the, the people that refashioned the albums, or in Britain, well, probably more likely in India, they used an authentic seal to validate the 19th century folios by stamping some of the 17th century folios and some of the 19th century folios with the same seal. This is the current scholarly opinion. But ironically, building on the work of Sue Strong on the margins of the, of the album, which um, really has um, changed the, 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 shifted the date to a much early, or earlier dating in the reign of Jahangir. Probably these materials date to not, not far, pr probably the seal is not too far off the mark, but it's only a coincidence. So it is Jahangir's reign, and it is in the middle of Jahangir's reign, around perhaps 1615, so thereabouts, but it's only a coincidence. And that's why I didn't discuss the seal, because I thought there was but thanks for bringing up the issue, of course. And of course, it's too big a seal for, for being a sort of um, library seal or, or, or owner seal. It's more of an official. Hmm? It's being used, not the way the rule Exactly, exactly. It's out of context. Um, Great. Thanks very much, Laura. A ter a terrific talk. And I'm, I'm wondering just to kind of, if you could ex uh, extend the extension here. This extension to the right is, it seems so curious as a, uh, a modification of a painting and, you know, and the whole field of 
I'm going to call it the aesthetics of mogul painting, seems to be something that's calling out for some additional reflection. The kinds of things that you're pointing out through the ultraviolet uh, that of this palimpsest development of painting and extensions, does this kind of lead, lead you to be able to kind of think about the aesthetics of mogul paintings in new ways or uh, just to kind of um, and broaden the generalization of the specific observations on this painting? I think the compilers, I, I'm not sure uh, at this, this is, a, I'm not sure I fully understood your question, but um, I think the, the compilers of the album, uh, the, of Imperial Mughal albums were quite careful in their choice of format. They tried to match the format between um, overall between pages or between facing pages. Um, they couldn't always do that, but they tried to do that. And some of these pictures from Bukhara are really sort of have a vertical emphasis that's quite common in Bukhara, but it's not used at the Mughal courts. So that would be the logical explanation here. Plus, um, I've come across other um, Mughal album folios where you see these extensions even on Mughal album materials or earlier Mughal album materials and there's a page that I published online you can find it um, on asianart.com online I published it a few years ago in collaboration with the um, conservators and scientists at the Los Angeles um, County Museum of Art and there an older Mughal album folio was incorporated completely and the margins were painted over, and an extension of the scene was painted over the margins. So you see a hunter with attendants, and the attendants were added, covering up an earlier margin. And you, you would wonder, wouldn't, have, wouldn't it have been easier to just remove the old margins? But no, they kept them, and probably because they were heirlooms. They were sort of, they were part of the object itself, but they refashioned them, and they had no, no problem at all um, painting over the margins and extending the picture. And they wanted to extend the picture because that's a bigger album than this, and the picture was really too small. But they wanted to collect it, probably. It meant something for them. So that's, that's what we explored a few years ago <laughs> in Los Angeles. So yeah, I don't know if I answered your, your question, but yes, it, it, we see this, and there's, it's not a, a strange thing. Uh, there's someone else. I guess the the question is that you have you know the, some thinking and discussion of uh, hybridity and the mogul aesthetics, and so is this going to figure into that conversation, or would you say no? Really, this has uh, got this logic of album composition, almost design uh, aesthetics, as much as it is of the painting itself. There's both. I think there's both. I mean, in, when they were acutely aware of the visual aspects, of course, because they were visual experts in the atelier, but they were equally aware of the textual references. And I think we've been emphasizing one side of the story a little too much. Or maybe it's neither side of the story, actually, because uh, the look really at just paintings, the way they, they were published until a few years ago without the margins, just the painting, that makes no sense anymore. Fortunately, a lot of colleagues share this idea, so you can't look either at the design or <laughs> at the contents of, of the verses that way. So, Sorry we to need to finish. Interrupt, but um, our galleries are open for only a short period of time. So, if you'd like to see the exhibition, uh, maybe uh, Laura can answer some of the questions uh, during your visit. Excellent. Thank you very much again, and for this wonderful talk. Thank to you, Laura. Thank you so much.